when the FBI is doing hostage negotiations, they have eight people listening to the phone call, all picking up different details, right? If you're trying to spot a lie in real time, you only have yourself to rely on. You don't have eight other guys, um, uh, guys and ladies listening with you to point out stuff and catch different things. You have to catch everything yourself. So, uh, and the, F- the CIA calls it L squared mode. Everyone's got a term for it where you're paying attention to a bunch of things at once. In reality, I prefer to focus on one thing all the way. And that's how I come to different conclusions in cases like this than the behavior panel, apparently. Only one of us can be right. Psychopaths are the best natural liars on earth. They can fool facial facial analysis, body language analysis, and even beat a polygraph. So what's the secret to catching them in a lie? In this video, I'll show you four ways. I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. And if you tap that thank you button, I appreciate it. In today's video, we're going to watch an interview that Dr. Phil did with the parents of Summer Wells. This is the seventh video in my Summer Wells series. And in this portion of Dr. Phil's interview with them, they will actually sit down with two body language experts from the behavior panel. And although I'm not a psychologist, I cannot diagnose Don as a psychopath. I have seen him exhibit some signs of a psychopath, which we'll go over in this video. And as I said, a psychopath can beat body language analysis. So I want to see if he does that here. I've watched the first few minutes of this, but I've not actually watched the body language analysis portion. So I'm very very curious to see if the guys from the behavior panel uh, who analyze him here come up with different conclusions than I do. Without further ado, let's listen. Today, Today on Dr. Phil... A missing child. Breaking news and an Amber Alert now issued by the TBI for a missing five-year-old girl. Her parents trying to prove their innocence. They turned to social media for help, but online bullies began accusing them of having something to do with her disappearance. You didn't do anything to hurt your daughter? No, sir. Do you know what happened to Summer? No. Do you know who took Summer? No, I can't do this. I'm being interrogated again. There's nothing more to remember. We did see some interesting body language. And I wanted them to hold me. And just for context, if you watched my last Summer Wells video, Four Words Hoaxers Use, we watched the middle portion of this interview. So now we're going back to the beginning. So I don't want you to be confused if you watch that one. And now you're watching this one, if you're watching the videos in order on my DDX Summer Wells playlist. Five-year-old Summer went missing from her home in rural Tennessee. Her parents, Don and Candace, say they believe someone came through a wooded trail near their house and grabbed Summer. Don says that he fears his little girl is dead. Yet Candace says that she just must remain hopeful. Take a look. Breaking news, an Amber Alert now issued by the TBI for a missing five-year-old girl. The search continues for Summer Wells from Rogersville. Wells is roughly three feet tall, weighing 40 pounds with blonde hair and blue eyes. She was last seen wearing gray pants and a pink shirt. And she was reportedly last seen outside of her home in the area of Ben Hill Road and Beach Creek Road. 19 agencies, including the TBI and FBI, are assisting in the search along with air crews. The Tennessee Bureau of Investigation so the search for summer is, quote, definitely outside the norm. When it- I agree that this is an outside the norm case. If you've seen my other playlists, for example, Madeline McCann, John Benet Ramsey, um, Amanda Knox, et cetera, et cetera. This is one of the most unusual cases we've analyzed on the channel simply because the parents are so bizarre, which we will get into. And outside of Casey Anthony and OJ Simpson, I think that Don Wells is the only other true psychopath we've seen on the channel. And once again, just as a disclaimer, I am not a psychologist. I cannot diagnose Don Wells. But in my last video about him, he actually exhibited what's known as duper's delight, which is a visual 
um, he actually giggled at the idea of Dr. Phil saying that he believes he is innocent. And this is something that psychopaths do. They, they like to lie for the sake of lying and getting away with it. And when they get away with it, they sometimes experience such an endorphin rush that they smile and giggle. So if you haven't seen that one, I recommend checking out after this, as well as my short where I actually show OJ Simpson bursting out laughing, talking about um, the idea that he murdered his wife. So when I saw that, I thought to myself, Don Wells may in fact be a psychopath, which is why he's the perfect candidate for this video, where I will show you four ways to catch a psychopath. And they are very difficult to catch. But we do have four ways, and if we rely on them, we can do it reliably. When it comes to the standard amount of time for a missing persons case like this. Despite doing everything within our power and exploring all avenues, the circumstances leading to Summer's disappearance remain unclear. We continue to hold out hope that Summer will be found safe. We will not quit until we find Summer Wells. You know, in reflecting back and recalling that day, Candace says that she and Summer had a great day, from running errands to swimming in a nearby lake to planting flowers with Grandma. When they got home, Candace watched Summer go through the front door, but she never saw her come out. June 15th, 2021, it was just a normal day. I called my wife and she was getting her mother's prescription. So I decided just to go ahead and work late. We just finished planting flowers and then Summer was putting the rocks on top and then. All right, I just saw something here. Ever since I started this series one month ago, so we're, we're this is our seventh video on Summer Wells. I've had people in the comments tell me that there's a video of Summer dancing in front of a for sale sign, which is bizarre because I do think as crazy as it sounds, it is possible in this circumstance that they literally sold their daughter to someone they know. And if this is a first video you're seeing of mine, um, let me assure you, I do not go in on crazy theories. It's very difficult for me to go in on on such theories. And I don't come to those theories lightly. It's always based on the words of the parents. So before I get comments saying, hey, DD, that's insane. There's no way they could have sold their daughter. Um, it is a possibility based on their own words. I recommend watching the playlist in order to see how we came to that. And I think we just saw that video right here. Go through the front door, but she never saw her come out. June 15th, 2021, it was just a normal day. I called my wife and she was getting her mother's prescription. So I decided just to go ahead and work late. We just finished planting flowers and then Summer was putting the rocks on. So there it is, Summer dancing in front of a barrel that says for sale. Could this just be a, a sad coincidence? Of course. Um, but it does make you wonder, why were they filming this? Who was this video for? We have so few videos of her. And they just happened to have a video of her dancing in front of a barrel that says for sale. And in their own language, one of the possibilities is that they literally sold their daughter. On top. And then. For example, I wonder where this video was posted. Who did they film it for? What was the intention behind such a subtle juxtaposition of their daughter with her shaved head right before she went missing and a barrel saying for sale. She got a piece of candy from grandma and then she asked to go back in the house with the boys. Well, she walked right in the house. After Summer went inside, I walked back over here to my mom's camper and I fixed my mom's knee brace when she was sitting right here in the doorway. And I told my mom that I have to go back in with the kids. Helping my mom with the knee brace only took like two to three minutes. After I came into the house, I asked the boys where she was, and they said that she went downstairs to play in the playroom. And I came into the playroom and looked. I even looked under the bunk beds and everywhere, and she wasn't here at all. And when I couldn't find someone in the basement, I'd come outside, and I stood up here on this hill, and I hollered for her and told So I'm not going to belabor this point. We've already analyzed this story, and to me, it has all the hallmarks of a scripted story, i.e. a story that was 
created in advance, agreed upon by the parents that they would stick to it. And it has the hallmarks of a scripted story. So I've done two videos on how to spot a scripted story, so I'm not going to belabor it here. We told the boys that she wasn't down there. And then I went outside and I called Donnie right away. About 5.30 p.m., my wife Candace called and said she couldn't find Summer. I says, well, hang up for me and call 911. So I threw my tools in the car as fast as I could, got in there and started down the road and called 911 myself. I passed all kind of cars in double yellow and everything when I'm getting really worried. So I, here's my road. I pulled down here. Here's the creek right here. I one way to spot a made-up story, a fabricated story, is liars tend to switch to present tense when they are making up something on the spot. So we saw Amber Heard do this. When she talked about times that Johnny Depp allegedly attacked her, for example, on the plane, she would say, I was sitting in my seat, Johnny comes over, he slaps me, I walked to the front of the plane, Johnny says, get back over here, right? So every time she talked about something that Johnny did, it was in present tense. Every time she talked about something she did, it was in past tense, which typically is a good indicator that someone is telling you the truth when they're saying stuff in past tense. And when they switch to present tense, it's because they're making that part of the story up. Now, there are exceptions. For example, when someone's been traumatized and they're speaking about traumatic event, they can switch into present tense. But the switching back and forth between past and present is the red flag. And here, Don switches into present tense. I'm one one myself. I've passed all kind of cars in double yellow and everything when I'm getting really worried. So I right, I'm getting really worried. If he were actually worried, if he's telling us a true story, I would expect him to say, I was really worried. The anxiety was building up. My wife just called me and told me she couldn't find my daughter. I'm ra I was racing home. Um, you know, my heart was beating. I was getting worried. I was getting nervous. But instead, he says it in the present tense. So we flag that. Does that mean that he's lying? No, of course not. We need multiple signs of deception to, de to determine that someone's lying. All right. At this point, we'll get into our first of the four tells of a psychopath. So I posted this on my X account a few minutes ago. So one of the great indicators of a psychopath is they tell bold stories. So they are not shy about making up a story and saying it boldly, even to the police, even to the media. Whereas normal liars, for example, in my opinion, the McCanns, are more reticent about making up a bold story on the fly and telling it to the police, right? In their case, in the beginning, they were very reticent about talking at all, which is typical of non-psychopathic liars, i.e. the run-of-the-mill normal liar. But psychopaths like Casey Anthony or O.J. Simpson or Don Wells, in my opinion, I believe all three are psychopaths, are not shy about making up a bold story. They like the thrill of making up a story. They get excited by getting away with it. And they think they're smarter than everybody. So they don't think they'll get caught. They're not expecting someone like me to go back and listen and parse their words. Right? They're not predicting people like you and me to come along. So they don't mind telling bold stories. But the stories of a psychopath lack two things. They lack emotion. So they might tell you a big story about where they went, what they did, what they saw. It could all be 100% fake. But they forget to include, include emotion. Right? I was scared. I was nervous. Even there, right? even in his, uh, what I believe to be a made-up story, he inserted the emotion in the present tense. Right? He was thinking, I've got a camera on me. I've got to say this now wasn't included in his original scripted story. So they, they lack emotion and they lack relationship details. And this is because psychopaths do not experience emotion like you or me. They don't have attachments to people. Um, they, that's someone like Chris Watts, who I believe is also a psychopath, who can murder his entire family 
because they're a nuisance to him. He wants to date a new girl. He wants to start a new life. He could divorce his wife. That's what a normal person might do. Or in his case, if he's a psychopath, it's easier just to kill her and the kids because there's no relationship. Why leave them alive to have a nagging ex-wife, to pay alimony, child support for uh, 18 years? She was still pregnant with another kid. He could just kill them all and go live with his girlfriend. So in Don Wells case, I think if he is a psychopath, we're going to see lots of missing emotion from his stories as well as relationship details. And already we can see he tripped up on the emotional part of that story. And then since we're here, the second tell of a psychopath is Duper's Delight. So we have bold stories lacking emotion relationship details and Duper's Delight. And there's two more that hopefully I'll be able to point out in this video. So I, here's my road. I pull down here. Here's the creek right here. I notice my three boys are together and they're over here looking. And then I looked over that way and see my neighbor coming this way towards my boys. And my heart sunk because I knew she was abducted. I knew she was. All right. Another sign of a hoax, like my last video, one sign of a hoax is conclusiveness, where someone says they knew something happened without any evidence of it. So, for example, there where Don says, I knew she had been abducted. As far as his story goes, if it's true, he just pulled up to the scene. How would he know she was abducted? There's no evidence. How did they not know she wandered, didn't just wander off? Or a bear snatched her? Or she was playing hide and seek and she was still in that messy, um, hoarders looking house. So the fact that he's so conclusive pulling up to the scene that she was kidnapped is a red flag for a hoax, a red li a flag that they're lying. Secondly, let's say the story was true. Why would he not suspect the neighbor? Why did he not say, hey, what are you doing here near my sons? He sees a full grown man out there near his sons. His wife just told him his daughter's missing. Would he not even question the neighbor? But he doesn't say that. And then the third inconsistency in this story, right, th just these brief few seconds here, is, and I pointed this out in a previous video, if you thought your daughter was kidnapped, would you send your sons out, who are also children, out into the woods to look for her? If you actually believe there was a kidnapper or a potential kidnapping ring out in the woods, would you send your sons out there alone to go look for your daughter who you believe is kidnapped or abducted? Of course not, right? You would bring the sons home, lock the doors, call the police. You would not send them out alone into the woods to look for her. That's something you do when you're bad at imagining what someone in that position would have done. So all three of those things, the fact that he didn't suspect the neighbor, that he was conclusive his daughter was abducted without any evidence, and the fact that they sent the sons out to look for Summer all indicates to me that they knew there was no kidnapper in the area. In other words, it means they knew what happened to Summer. And that's just critical thinking. Right? Very little of what I just said was actually any statement analysis at all. It was just using my imagination and thinking, what would someone actually in that situation do? And liars typically don't take that step. It's very hard to act exactly how you should act in a situation that you're not actually in. Even blockbuster movies with million dollar budgets, professional scriptwriters, unlimited time to, to uh, make sure there's no loopholes, still have plot holes, right? So fabricating an airtight story is virtually impossible. And on this channel, what we do is we look for those plot holes. He was gone. Just like many parents of missing children these days, Don says they turn to social media for help. But instead of sending clues to his daughter's whereabouts, online bullies began accusing them of being guilty of either killing their daughter or having something to do with her disappearance. So Candace and Don say to prove the naysayers wrong, they sat down with body language experts Scott Rouse and Greg Hartley. Now, all right, so before we get into this, because this is going to be what I really want to see in this video, is if they do fool the body language guys, how do they do it? As I said, psychopaths can fool body language analysts. They can also fool 
Ekman followers who believe in facial uh, microexpression analysis. The only people they can't fool are people like me who engage in deception detection, statement analysis, critical thinking, logic. But before we get into that, notice how Dr. Phil said that the people who question them are bullies. And I just want to address that quickly. I get lots of comments on my channel, people saying, hey, how dare you, DD, question these parents who have lost their kid? You know, aren't you ashamed of making money, making videos about these people? How do you sleep at night? And whenever I do a new Summer Wells video, I get lots of new subscribers. So I'm sure some people will make those comments. And I just want to give you my response to those sorts of comments before we get into this part of the video. Whether it's me or any other YouTuber or commentator commenting on a case about a missing child and people are trying to silence them by shaming them, here's my response and I recommend you can copy this, take it for yourself, make it your own. But here's my response preemptively to any comments like that. I only care about two things, the truth and teaching people how to spot it before misinformation becomes too powerful. I can't be shamed. I can't be bought. And I can't be blackmailed. Capiche? All right, with that said, let's watch the body language guys from the behavior panel analyze Don Wells, see if I agree with them, see where we disagree. If you followed my channel for a while, you know that we disagree on lots of stuff. I disagree with them about the McCanns, and I disagree with them about the Wells. And I'm sure those aren't the only cases we disagree on. Now, Scott and Greg are interrogators who have worked with the FBI, law enforcement, and the military. Scott says his approach is biological, and Greg looks for motivation. Together, they have been called a human lie detector. Now, Scott and Greg agreed to sit down with Don and Candace to dive deeper into their story. There's no such thing as body language of deception. There's only body language of increased stress. Hey. He, he said what I've been saying about body language. So I actually give him kudos to, for that. As I've always said, body language is great for communication, right? Like you see me doing it all the time with my hands. Or if I smile, I'm happy. If I'm frowned, I'm mad. Mm, I'm sad. That's what body language is great for, right? I cross my arms. I'm, I'm not feeling comfortable. So body language is great for communicating overt things. So don't get me wrong. Body language is great for communication. It's great for seeing if someone is stressed or cold, but it is not useful at all for detecting deception because if someone folds their arm or blinks a lot or looks left or right, it doesn't tell me they're lying. It just tells me they're nervous or they're stressed and they could be nervous or stressed for a million different reasons. In the case of Don and Candace Wells here on the Dr. Phil show, they could be nervous just because they're getting questioned by two guys who uh, interrogate people with the FBI. That's enough to be nervous about. Just like if the police pull you over, even if you didn't do anything wrong, you stiffen up, your adrenaline rushes, your eyes widen. That doesn't mean that when you tell them you weren't speeding that you're lying. So I'm glad he said that up front because that's what I've always said. All right, and before we watch them, let's get into this next way to spot a psychopath. So psychopaths are great at convincing people with face and body language, which is why on my channel and me personally, I just ignore body language entirely. I prefer not to see the mother of a missing child crying or um, getting, you know, flustered or boisterous because really good actresses and actors of course can tug on my heartstrings it doesn't mean they're not lying but it can persuade me so if you just ignore the body language entirely it's a lot easier to listen to what they're actually saying so especially that's especially true when it comes to psychopaths they are very good at acting they can really convince people by acting However, what they struggle with, just like any other liar in the world, 
is saying the right words and coming up with an airtight alibi, airtight story. And that's where even the best liars in the world fail. And that's what we look for on this channel. So when we see these parents crying, um, and we've seen clips already from this that, that Candace is going to be crying, uh, do not allow for it to tug on your heartstrings. You have to block that out. And it might sound heartless. I might sound like one of those bullies that Dr. Phil is talking about. That I'm bullying these people. But that's not the case. I personally have no stake in any of the people we cover here. If something I say here helps find Summer, that's great. That's not the point of my channel, right? The point of my channel is not to find Madeline or not. To, it's not to find Summer. It's not to figure out what happened to John Bonet. It's not to incite harassment against the parents or people I think are guilty. It's literally to use them because you'll watch videos about them to teach you how to spot lies and manipulation before it's too late. That's literally the entire reason I came back to YouTube. There's so much advanced lying out there now uh, that soon with AI and, and uh, just data, it's going to be too hard to detect a lie unless you've learned how to do it already. All right, so here's the four things. We'll go through all four of these so you can look for them yourself when we watch this. So number one, four tells of a psychopath. The first one is they are very convincing at face and body language, so you just have to ignore that entirely. And on this channel, we already do that. Number two, psychopaths may exhibit duper's delight. So that is one great tell. They enjoy lying. They enjoy getting away with it. They're not stressed about lying, so they might actually just display duper's delight if you make them think that you believe them. Number three, they are very bold storytellers. They will make up a story on the spot because they think they're smarter than you. They will tell a bold story, a big detailed story, but their story will miss out on emotional and relationship details. And then fourth, uh, psychopaths struggle face to face. So it's a lot easier for them to lie over the phone or over Zoom or as I've seen um, with people like Ziggy where they actually do a YouTube live uh, call with them right, or a phone call. Psychopaths excel at distant interviews, but it's a lot harder face to face, which is why I'm glad that these guys have gotten Don Wells in the studio to interview him face to face. It's also the reason that when I issued my challenge to Don Wells two videos ago, I told him, you don't even have to, to meet with me or talk to me. I will send you questions. All you have to do is write your answers. And if you satisfy me with your answers, I'll never make, make, make another video about you again. Because I knew that he was more likely to take me up on that challenge than to actually ever talk with me um, or meet with me. Not that I ever want to meet him. All right. So now let's watch these guys. And that indicates something for us. There are no absolutes. Just because someone does this doesn't mean they're lying or telling you the truth. And in real life every day, debriefers do exactly what we do. And they find information the person doesn't remember that they saw. I thought it was a four-wheel drive, like Ford Escape or a Bronco or it something. It looked like a blue minivan to me, but I don't a know. small blue minivan? That's what it looked like to me. We knew we would get to a point where it was going to be hard emotionally. And that's hard to do because people will think you're a monster, but that's important to getting facts. So I've never actually watched one of their videos. I have lots of people telling me that, that I disagree with them, right? So that my views don't match with theirs. And um, maybe I don't give them a fair enough shake because lots of what they're saying here is good. Although I still do not believe in body language being a useful tool for detecting deception, but they also said that themselves. So I would be curious if on their channel, if they oversell their skills there by saying, hey, it looks like this guy's lying based on how he's doing this and that, right? Whereas here on the Dr. Phil show, they're being much more appropriate with how far their skills can actually take them. Do you know what happened to Summer? No. Do you know who took Summer? No. 
We actually hit harder on the questions for what happened that day. When did this happen? How long was it before this happened? When you come home, when you first come home. I'm not doing all that. I'm not going all the way back. I can't really? do this. So you know they're, they're trying no. to help. They're trying to help. It's not helping me. I know. I know, it's but it, it, they might. There's might. nothing more to remember. We did see some interesting body language. I don't want to go home. <laughs> Well, guys. All right, I hope it shows the full interview. So we saw some clips there. I could pause on literally every single clip they showed, but I'm hoping they're showing the, they're going to show the full interview so we can break it down. This is an interview that you conducted um, near their home, and a lot of interesting things turned up, and I want to look at those and discuss them. Now, Scott... What has jumped out to you most about either one of these two, e either mom or dad? What's jumped out at you most? The differences in comfort and discomfort as we speak with them. There are certain things we touch on, and when, they be, when we're talking to them and they're comfortable, they start becoming uncomfortable due to stress. Those are the things we look for, and we saw those things jump out. Yeah, and we're going to look at some of those in a minute. Greg, how about you? Yeah, Doc, so we look for a baseline, and baseline can be everything from speech patterns to movement to all of those. Everyone here, if you've ever been pulled over by a police officer, the way you talk changes, the way you move changes, that's stress. We're looking for that when we're talking to these people. Okay. And it's different. In so you basically used the, almost the exact same example I used. <laughs> and stress does not indicate deception. So that's the logical leap that lots of body language people make. If you're on the Dr. Phil show, even if you are telling the truth that your kid was actually kidnapped, of course you're going to be stressed because you're going to think, hey, do I come off looking innocent? Do I come off looking guilty? Why are these two guys staring at me like this? Do they think I'm guilty? What if I say the wrong word? The other weakness of body language, uh, just like a polygraph, is you need a baseline. Whereas what we do here is I don't need a baseline. I'm literally listening to what the subject says. I'm listening to what they say precisely, and I'm pointing it out. So, for example, if they say, I didn't do anything wrong, like, like uh, Alan Dershowitz said in, in the video I did about him. right? He said, I didn't do anything wrong. I don't need a baseline. I'm just listening to what he says. Okay, he says he didn't do anything wrong. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is the word wrong. Wrong is a subjective word. All he's saying is he didn't do something that he considers wrong. He didn't say he didn't sleep with a minor or uh, you know didn't uh, sleep with Jane Doe X. He just said he didn't do anything wrong. And maybe in his mind, wrong means, means that he had mens rea, that he did something knowing she was underage. Right, So we don't need a baseline. We're just listening to exactly what people say. And there's a good, a second good example I'll show you right now quickly. I don't know anything about Nikki Haley. But I don't need a baseline, for example, to see here where a few days ago she denied or she admitted to having an affair with uh, some guys while she was married. But when she denied it earlier, she said, I was 100% faithful. Saying you're 100% faithful is not the same as saying I did not sleep with X, Y, and Z. And on X, when I posted this, I said, this mirror Bill's, Bill Clinton's denial about sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky. Both hinge on the speaker's interpretation of a subjective word. In Nikki Haley's case, it's faithful. Right. So we don't need to know anything about Nikki Haley, Alan Dershowitz, Bill Clinton to listen to their words and determine if they're being deceptive or not. Are they using overly specific words, overly vague words? Are they evading the question? Are they going on a tangent to run down the clock and look like they're giving an answer, etc., etc.? Right. If you've pre-ordered the deception deck, which is my 52 favorite rules for spotting deception, um, those will be shipping out at the end of this month. You have 52 different tells for spotting a liar, none of which require a baseline. That's why what we do on this channel is so powerful. All right, let's listen. And Candace and the Don. 
Yeah. Now, Candace didn't want to be interviewed at first. She was very resistant to this, and it's only through building a relationship with Don and him kind of helping with that that she was willing to sit down. Now, I've worked with dozens and dozens and dozens of missing children cases, and most parents are willing to do anything and everything, including with law enforcement. They say, look, rule me out. D do these elimination polygraphs, blood tests, DNA, whatever, to rule me out so you can stop messing with me and start looking with everybody else. Why was there reluctance here? There's so Dr. Phil is correct. That's why, for example, when the McCanns didn't do a polygraph where they refused to answer questions, in the heat of their daughter being missing, it's a giant red flag. Non-cooperativeness is a red flag. And here, Dr. Phil says that they're reluctant. In my last video, I pointed out that, that liars are reticent, which is one of the cards in the deception deck. Reticence. It's one of the signs of a hoaxer. So what Dr. Phil's call reluctance, I call reticence, right? They're not forthcoming. They're not candid and open like you would expect them to be. As far as they're concerned, Dr. Phil and these guys are there to try to help them find their missing daughter. It does not make sense for them to be reticent and refuse to talk unless they have some sort of guilty knowledge or they're trying to hide something and they're scared that they will slip up. There's some reluctance because they do have some history with law enforcement and those things. And if you look at us, we kind of look like law enforcement, so it takes yeah. a little bit. Yeah. yeah, you look like cops. <laughs> wow. right, well, let's start looking at some of these tapes just right off. Let's, let's start with Don, because you did sit down with him first, and you spent a long time interviewing him, but we've agreed to look at some particular clips that seem to be of some significance. Is there anything about Candace's story that makes you question the story? No, not the way it played out and everything like that. I mean, yeah, you always have questions, and I'd ask myself, and uh, with the way that it happened and her emotions and her state of mind. What, did you, what were the questions that you had? This is a good question, and this is something I've said about the McCanns as well. Summer, according to their story, which I believe is scripted, disappeared while Don was at work. So his daughter went missing. He comes home. His wife tells him the story. When your kid is missing, everybody is a suspect. Even your wife might be a suspect. You know, are you telling me the truth? W were you off in another room and something happened to her? Just be honest with me. Just tell me. Also, the Candace's mother lived with them. Don never questioned the grandmother. Uh, Never question the boys, right? Like I pointed out earlier, never question that neighbor. <laughs> that lack of curiosity is a great indicator of a hoax, that they're not suspecting everyone because they actually know what happened. Whereas if they actually didn't know what happened, everyone would be a suspect. Even your wife would be a suspect until you're convinced that she, you know, wasn't being negligent and the kid wandered off and now she's scared of you being upset with her. So she's covering it up. <laughs> And like I said, similarly with the McCanns, when Madeline was allegedly abducted, the McCanns didn't question any of their friends who were on the trip with them. They didn't question the guy who checked the room before Kate, right? He would be the obvious suspect. He's the one who checked the bedroom right before Kate did. He had opportunity. He had access to the room. Uh, he had no alibi, but they never suspected him. They never suspected hotel staff. It's a great indicator of a hoax that they actually know what happened. A lack of curiosity. And Don's answer here was despicable, right? It was weak, very wordy, which indicates nervousness. And it was wrong in that he says, you know, the way it all played out. What played out? It's an interesting choice of words, almost like it was a play acting, like a screenplay. But we're coming up on 40 minutes here, so I'm not going to go do a deep dive into that. If you see my videos, um, feel free to drop in the comments other things you noticed in his um, response that were red flags. 
Besides the fact that A, it was the incorrect response. B, it was extremely wordy. And C, he talked about it playing out. I mean, I, I, not, I don't really have any. I mean, I question. Not, I don't really have any questions. I mean. So your daughter's missing and you have no questions. You don't know what happened to your daughter and you have zero questions. That is a giant red flag. And I'm glad the behavior panel guys are not jumping all over him. Their technique so far, what I've seen, is very good. So maybe I have, I've been too critical of them in the past. Still, I disagree with them about the Wells and I disagree with them about the McCanns. And I'm sure we disagree about plenty of other things. And part of the reason is body language guys can be fooled by um, psychopaths, by acting. Okay. Now, you, you guys know I'm highly involved in interrogation and deception detection as well. Oh, yeah. And from a psychological standpoint, not paying any attention yet to any of the body language or any of the physiology of that, uh, I heard him say yes twice and no four times in there. He was stammering, stuttering all over the place. What'd you make of that? So for me, what I see is editing as you speak. You'll notice his eyes are dropping down to his left. He's having kind of an internal conversation about how do I answer this very complicated question. And I think he edits, he speaks, he edits, he speaks, and never finishes a sentence. There aren't versions of the truth. Correct. We were on the impression he was uh, holding back a little information from us at that, <clears throat> at that point. Okay, now this is important to me because we're trying to find this little girl. I don't care about anything else. I want to know what happened to this little girl. I wouldn't be doing this story otherwise. I'm just interested if Summer has been abducted and she's somewhere, uh, I want to find her. Uh, if her life has been taken, then we need to know that. I mean, answers have to be found here. She deserves that. And uh, so I'm really concerned it's very clear to me that he is editing. That means he's holding something back, guarding something. He has knowledge of something that he's not disturbing up. So Dr. Phil, I also agree with. Also, I think they're being a little bit, they're tempering what they're saying here, right? So they could be a lot more conclusive like I am. Like, hey, that's a giant red flag that he said he has no questions. So they might be thinking that. But if you've seen my previous video, um, where we looked at the middle portion of this episode, you'll know that they bring the parents on and they question them again. So this is likely all technique. They know the parents are back in the green room listening to this, so they can't go totally on the offensive because I do believe Dr. Phil, when he says he's trying to get some truth out of them, if he goes on a, the offensive and tries to get a gotcha question, it's not going to work. The parents are so reticent, they just simply will refuse to answer. So we have to give some leeway to their technique. And don't get me wrong, I, I by no means think that Dr. Ville is the perfect interviewer. But uh, he does a good job here. If you've seen my video about him, uh, my two parts about him interviewing Burke Ramsey, you'll know that I think he did a terrible job in that one. Exactly. So, and so the question is, what's he know that he's not telling us? This is the first time in any of your interactions that he ever used this word. Jesus, get out. So we were suspicious of him, of course. And later, at this point, she wants out. She came there to help find her daughter. Correct. But you've raised the stakes to the point that, forget about my daughter, I want out of the room. Okay, let's take a look at this next tape here, and this is just kind of a follow-up, a redirect on some of the things that he had to say. Let's look at this. So what do you say to somebody who says, no, you're involved, your family's involved? How do you respond to that? Well, for three months, I spent on the phone. All right, um, let me rewind. So this is how Don responds to people who say that he's involved. 
what is the answer you would expect? An innocent person, typically innocent people do not allow for the cloud of guilt to hang upon them. So they issue clear denials. So they issue reliable denials early and often. What I expect Don to say here is those people are wrong or those people are mistaken. Right? Or I had nothing to do with the disappearance of my daughter. Let's see what Don actually says. So what do you say to somebody who says, no, you're involved, your family's involved? How do you respond to that? Well, for three months, I spent on the phone for three months. I, I accepted every friend request there was, people want. What have you noticed so far? No denial. He's explaining himself. He's trying to offer proof of what he did on social media. The, I don't know how, what, how social media relates to finding his daughter. He did not deny that he or his wife had anything to do with Summer's disappearance. Make note of that. Let's see if he actually ever makes a denial. And like I said, I've not watched this before. But liars are very predictable. And there's the reason I was able to make the deception deck. Because there's so many studies, empirical evidence of how liars lie. And if a liar actually did something, it's very difficult for them to actually deny it. Even a psychopath can struggle with it, as we're seeing here, in my opinion. Well, I'm your friend. I'm your family. We can report you. And, you know, through, for three months, I stayed on the phone day and night trying to find my baby. Because I figured you, Facebook's the best tool possible mm -hmm. to help find her. And, uh, but there's this group on Facebook combating us the whole time. The term for this is a tangent. So instead of denying that he and his wife had anything to do with their daughter's disappearance, he's giving us a rambling answer, trying to persuade us that they were looking for her. Trying to persuade me that you were on social media and staying up at night and chatting with people is not the same as telling me you didn't have anything to do with your daughter's disappearance. This is a red flag answer. Also, I suspect what they were doing on social media was trying to monitor what people were saying about them and if people believed they were guilty or not. The parents of uh, innocent parents of missing children do not spend their time browsing Facebook to see what people are saying about them. They cooperate with the police as fully as possible. They do not spend time on Facebook. And we don't know who this group is or what they're up to. Okay, now was he redirecting here or was he just concretely answering a question? Yes, yeah, so I'll let Scott answer last because he discovered this. When you ask this guy this question, what I was saying is, how do you respond to people who say you did this? Well, I expected, well, no, I didn't. But he doesn't. He goes, wow. There we go. These guys, Greg Hartley. I have not given Greg Hartley enough credit. On to talk about Facebook. In usual interrogations, we assume that is deceptive and avoiding. When Greg asks. Yes, yeah, so they say avoiding. I say it's a tangent. Right? He's evading the answer. He's not issuing a reliable denial him how he responded to that he's talking about responding to people on facebook he's talking about re responding to people on youtube he's had a whole lot of flack come from that direction so i understood that he didn't see it as when a, an investigator asked you that question or when i asked you that question he said in other words he took it as when social media asks you that question how do you respond to them that's that was his I mean, physically how do you do it come up here with me for a minute if you would and, and let's let's take a look at this because this so far, Greg has said lots of good things here. Um, I, I, I didn't catch the other guy's name. I think that he's cutting them a ton of slack, but that might also just be a good cop, bad cop play. I don't think they're that far off of each other's opinions where one thinks it was deceptive and the other one thinks, hey, he just interpreted it this way. Like I said, they know the parents are going to come on to the the day is here on the show after this portion. 
They want to keep them buttered up. They don't want them to storm out of the green room and leave. So this might just be a good cop, bad cop play. This, to me, would be just real deflection and deception unless you understand that he's very concrete For sure. in this. Let's look at how the question is asked. So what do you say to someone who says, no, you're involved, your family's involved? How do you respond to that? Well, okay, at that point you said, how do you respond to that? You meant... How do you respond to it? Like, no, I deny that. I don't. Exactly. I but from instead, an abstract. he says, well, I use the phone. Right. I use the keyboard. That's what you're talking about, exactly. right? Exactly. Did you consider this deceptive at all? Or did you think he just... It's deceptive. And it's a technique of going on a tangent, not answering the question. It's non-responsive. For example, if we were in a courtroom... And I had a witness up on the stand and I'm cross-examining him. And I say, how do you respond to people who accuse you of killing your daughter? And they started talking about Facebook. I can tell you the first time I paused that video, when he started answering right after three words, I would object as non-responsive. Right, talking about Facebook, any reasonable person would understand that that's not what they were asking. And obviously they could have rephrased the question if they actually believed that's how he interpreted it, right? He willingly interpreted it in a way that would allow him to avoid giving a reliable denial and uh, to talk about the practicality of how he physically responds to people accusing him. Was answering the wrong question. Initially, we thought it was deceptive that he was he was redirecting the answer, <laughs> redirecting the, the answer to the question to somewhere else. That's what we we, we thought. And there are yeah. two indicators that made us think that his blink rate goes through the roof, which means you're feeling stress, but it can also be processor speed as I am trying to think through something. And we- All right. So now we're getting into the voodoo. I agree with some of the stuff they say. Some of it, I think, is voodoo and non-helpful and actually distracting from listening to what someone's saying. So when we're talking about blink rates, uh, that's where I tune out. Especially when you're watching someone's eyes, you can only focus on a certain number of things at once. And a psychopath can fool you by acting. They can cry on demand. They can persuade you that they are actually sad. They're exceptional actors. So if you, with the limited bandwidth you have in your brain, my recommendation is listen to their words and forget about the blink rate and forget about the tears. If someone starts crying, black it out. Right? You have to block that out. And we think that's what we're saying. Okay. And when you say his blink rate went through the roof, you're talking. Just paying attention to someone's words is already hard enough. So by excluding body language, you eliminate the chance of someone persuading you just by acting and crying or uh, pretending they're innocent. You allow for more of your brain bandwidth to be focused on their words where it should be focused. When the FBI is doing hostage negotiations, they have eight people listening to the phone call, all picking up different details, right? If you're trying to spot a lie in real time, you only have yourself to rely on. You don't have eight other guys, um, uh, guys and ladies listening with you to point out stuff and catch different things. You have to catch everything yourself. So, uh, and the the CIA calls it L squared mode. Everyone's got a term for it where you're paying attention to a bunch of things at once. In reality, I prefer to focus on one thing all the way. And that's how I come to different conclusions in cases like this than the behavior panel, apparently. Only one of us can be right. You're talking about while he's answering the question. That's correct. Yes. Well, for three months, I spent on the phone. And since Don just said the word three, I'll show you the three card from the deception deck. As you know, the deception deck is my 52 favorite rules for spotting deception. You can pre-order at deceptiondeck.com. And the word three is in the deck under the spade suit, which is deceptive words and phrases.
And here's the card. As you can see, three. It's a flash card to remember the rule. You have three on the front. And on the back, you have the rule and an example. I'll just quickly read you the rule for three. Liars often use the number three in their statements. If a statement includes a three, like 3 p.m., third floor, or $300,000, it might be fabricated. So here I think we can actually check the timeline, but just be aware that if a liar is pressed to come up with a number, for example, I was mugged by three people, or $300 was missing from my wallet, it might be fabricated, something you need to take note of. Three months, I spent on the phone for three months. I, I accepted every friend request there was, people want. <laughs> okay, his blink rate here is probably seven. So while they're focusing on the blink rate, I'm focusing on the tells of a psychopath. And one of them, like I said, is they are happy to tell a bold, detailed narrative. However, they forget to include emotion and relationship details. And what do we have here? We have him talking about the three months his daughter's been missing. And he has not told us how sad he is. No emotions. Or how his relationship, let's say, with his sons or his wife or with his missing daughter has been affected. How did it affect anyone else? How did he feel? We're just getting facts. I have a friend request this, friend request that. Um, so just take a note of that. Catching a psychopath is difficult, but there are tells, and now you have four ways to spot them, and we're starting to use this one right here. So besides all the other ways we spot liars, this one is unique to psychopaths. He's talking about Facebook, etc., etc. Three months, his daughter's missing. Where are all the words of emotion? I can see the tears in his eyes. He looks like the father of a missing child, but he looks sad and sullen. But a psychopath is a great actor. They are very convincing. But they forget to use the right words, particularly emotion and relationship. All right, I'm not going to belabor this. 70, 80 a minute. For sure. Please. And that's higher by far than anyone sitting here. Let's take a look at this third clip. Let's just watch it through and then we'll break it down. Go ahead. Do you know where Summer is? Oh, no. I wish Do you I have did. any earthly idea what happened to her? No. I wish I did. Do you think Candace had anything to do with it? No. And what about this? You, you, and you think what might have happened to her was what? She was kidnapped. She was kidnapped. So this is similar to the McCanns, which is why even if you came to my channel for the Summer Well series, I recommend watching my McCanns series as well. DDX Madeline McCann playlist, because there are a ton of parallels. Hoaxers lie the same way, whether it's a hoax about aliens like Bob Lazar, a hoax about Bigfoot like Bob Gimlin, or in my opinion, a hoax about a missing girl like the McCants, or a hoax about a kidnapping like the McCants, the Ramses, and the Wells, in my opinion. And one sign of a hoaxer, this is also in the Deception Deck, is conclusiveness, despite the evidence. Don says she was kidnapped as if it were a fact. He has zero curiosity about what his wife did, zero curiosity about what his mother-in-law did, zero curiosity if maybe the sons did something and you know might have hurt her or um, accidentally did something to her and then they, they're scared to tell him, zero curiosity if a bear took her or a coyote or one of the 12 dogs they had on the property snapped and dragged her off. It would not be the first time a dog killed a little kid. But we have zero curiosity and we have conclusiveness about the kidnapping without any evidence of a kidnapping. That is one giant sign of a hoax. Yeah. When he says kidnapped, I associate kidnapping because of my background with trading the person back for something. If that's the case, that has meaning. If it's just he uses words interchangeably, it has no meaning. Yeah, and, and, and we don't know. You know where some are. But... This is the first time that in any of your interactions that he ever Boy, used this word. She yes. was kidnapped. Right. Okay, so that's the first time that he ever used that. And he used abducted in your lead-in footage. Yes. If you right. Know. Abducted. 
Now, and there's a substantial difference. Yes. Abducted difference. is just all of a sudden she's there, then she's gone. Mm -hmm. Kidnapped is transactional. That's right. And that, that so here's where I disagree with them, right? They're parsing the word kidnapped um, based on their definition of kidnapped. Don might have a different definition of kidnapped. In his mind, a kidnap might not mean transaction or ransom note or request. Even in the legal sense of the word kidnapped, a parent can kidnap their own kid. If I lock you in a room, uh, uh, for how, depending on the, the full scenario, I could technically be kidnapping you. So kidnap does not always mean a ransom note. It's not like the movies where someone's kidnapped, so now we're going to get a phone call um, with someone using a thing to garble their voice who's going to tell us how much money to send. Now, that's a guilty language thing that we collectively look for in the business. Guilty knowledge means something. So we were suspicious of him, of course, and we developed a relationship with him that caused the second interview to occur. At this point, he's cooperating. Yes. Yes. And he's been cooperating throughout. Yes. yes. Sometimes to his detriment. Yes. For sure. With like social media and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, there's Candace. And you sat down with Candace with Don. Yes. And coming up, what was the question that caused Candace to take off her mic and walk away instead of staying hooked up to efforts that could lead to finding out what happened to her daughter. And that's a significant distinction because, as I said, most parents will do anything and everything to find their daughter. And you'll hear her say a very important sentence that spoke volumes to me. You'll find out what that is right after the break. He really knows how to tease a segment. All right, let's see. As you, as you know, I think Don is a psychopath. I'm undecided about Candace. Personally, of the two, I believe Candace is the better liar simply because she gives fewer statements. She's more reticent. The fact that Don does so much talking is another indicator that he might be a psychopath. Right? He thinks he can fool everybody he thinks he can hoodwink everybody. And that is one of the downfalls of a psychopath, right? So they're great natural liars, but the same thing that compels them to lie is the same way you can catch them. So as long as you ignore their facial expressions and body language and acting and dramatics and focus on potential duper's delight, the fact that they're enjoying lying and getting away with it, or the fact that they leave out things from their story that a true story would contain, like emotion or relationships. And if you can get them face to face, you'll be more likely to catch a psychopath. And because they think they're great liars, they are more likely to engage in, and give you the opportunity to meet them face to face and give more statements, right? So the thing that makes them a, a good, bold liar is also their downfall. What do you think should happen to somebody that did this? They should be put away for the rest of their lives. Did you do anything to Summer? No. Do you know what happened to Summer? It's been four months since Summer Wells was last seen at her home here on Ben Hill Road since the night of June 15th. Everybody's a person of interest till we find Summer. Authorities said all possibilities were on the table, but Summer's parents believe someone took her. I went down there to check, and she was nowhere in sight. She was just gone. Parents Don and Candace say they believe their daughter was abducted. You just heard Don say... And Dr. Phil is twisting their words slightly. They didn't say they believe their daughter was abducted. They said their daughter was abducted. They were much more conclusive than uh, Dr. Phil is saying here. Ever since that first interview, which we have analyzed in this series, I just showed a clip of, how important are inconsistencies is my video about it. They have been adamant, just like the McCann's since day one, that their kid was abducted. 
without any evidence of an abduction. That is the classic tell of a hoaxer. At least one of my four signs of a hoaxer that I've come up with and so far have not failed me. Say, well, maybe she was kidnapped. Was that just him using what he considers to be a synonym, or was it leakage of something he knows that he hadn't said before? Well, we're not sure about that. But when their story broke, the couple says the online bullies accused them of having something to do with the disappearance. Now, Don agreed to sit down with body language experts Scott Rouse and Greg Hartley in hopes of clearing his name. Don says Candace refused at first, but finally agreed to sit down. Candace, I'm going to have to ask you some hard questions. I told you this. I don't think Candace is a psychopath simply by the fact that she refused to sit down with these guys. Her extreme reticence reminds me of the McCants. She's not a big, bold liar. She knows she's a normal level liar. So her best defense is to be reticent to not say much, and that will at least stop her from saying something that will get her in trouble. The problem is, for her, we can also detect that. When someone's overly reticent, it is the sign of a hoax, right? So the four signs of a hoax, and I know I said this a lot, but if you're new to the channel, my four signs of a hoaxer are conclusiveness despite the evidence, extreme reticence about the money shot. In other words, extreme reticence about the thing they're lying about. So for example, if it's Bob Lazar talking about a UFO, the money shot is the UFO. If it's Bob Gimlin talking about Big Bigfoot, it's about when he saw Bigfoot. Uh, for the McCanns, it's about when they checked the room and found her gone, right? So the big thing that they have to sell you on in order to get away with their hoax. So conclusiveness despite the evidence, vagueness about the money shot, reticence about the money shot, and then a mismatch between the emotions they're displaying and the emotions they report in their story. So if someone is bold and brave enough to try to pull off a hoax, they are usually convinced that they can sell you on it with their tears and their acting, or even by coming up with fake evidence, right? So fake physical evidence but they still fail to report the right emotions because it's very hard, like I said, to put yourself in place of something that you're not actually in. The same reason Hollywood blockbusters have plot holes. Yes. Did you do anything to Summer? No. Do you know what happened to Summer? No. Do you know who took Summer? No. Anybody in your family no. involved with this? Not that I'm aware of, no. No, 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 tears. So we have mismatch of emotions with displayed emotions. She looks really sad. She's never once told us how sad she is. We have extreme reticence, right? Every word, every answer is a one word answer. She's treating this like they're interrogating her, right? Like it's a confrontational interrogation. Really, she should be telling us she's on TV right now. Give us some of the theories, throw out some of the suspects. Let us help you. And I can't even get into vagueness because she's being so reticent that she's not even telling us a little bit of a story to be vague about. And then we do have, in the very few words she said, we have conclusiveness. Right When they say, do you know who took her? She didn't say, I'm not even sure if she was taken. She just says, no, I don't know who took her. Right? She's still conclusive that she was taken. Just she doesn't know by who. And if you've seen my video, What Do Innocent Parents Look Like? You'll know that innocent parents speak very differently than this. To an innocent parent, every option is open. And that is probably one of my most underrated videos. So after watching this video, I recommend watching that one just so you can see the stark difference. The video is titled, What Do Innocent Parents Look Like? And the word on the thumbnail is mirror. And, you know, people are always going to point their fingers to people closest to somebody. It's just the nature of how it goes. What do you got to say to those people? I don't want to say it, but they're wrong. Why are they wrong? Because I had nothing to do with this. 
All right. So this, like I said, I think she's actually a better liar than Dawn simply because she's not as bold as Dawn. I had nothing to do with this. The issue with that denial is it's not specific. I had nothing to do is not the same as saying I didn't um, kill my daughter or I didn't hide my daughter. I didn't sell my daughter. So it's not a direct denial. But then again, they've given her a very vague question. So while it's not a perfect denial, perfect denials are usually specific. Um, this is better than what Don said. Okay. And the, like I said, ever since early on, I feel like Candace is going along with the story and that Don is the driver. So, for example, if they did sell Summer or, um, and I don't know why, they, they could have sold her to someone for drugs because they had to settle a debt um, or because someone they know took her and they're too afraid to turn that person in because they've got something on them or they can exert power over them. But if any of that did happen, I believe that Don is the one in charge because he is the type of person who is bold enough to pull off something so disturbing and to think he can get away with it. And so far, he is getting away with it. So he's been proven correct. So we should see him being even more boisterous next time we see him appear online. It'd be a great indicator if as time goes on, he appears more and more happy and boisterous because it will indicate to us that he's getting away with something, which means that he probably has guilty knowledge, and it is not what we'd expect of a parent of a missing child. If your kid is missing every day that goes on, it's less likely that your child will be returned. So I would love to see him appear back on social media and engage if he's happier and bolder and more brash than before. Because if his kid were actually missing, I would expect, expect him to be sadder and more desperate and more dejected than before. What jumped out at you? <laughs> Immediately, when she said no for the third time, it was quiet. It's a whisper. Okay, there's a distinct difference here qualitatively. Yes. No. Do you know what happened to Summer? No. Do you know who took Summer? That okay, that time, nothing came out of her mouth. Right. So, first question. That's all this. This is actually a common phenomenon with guilty people. So if you watch crime shows like First 48, stuff like that, you'll see this a lot. But even in your personal life, if someone's guilty, if you accuse them and accuse them, Innocent people will deny it and deny it, but guilty people sometimes will weaken their denial. They'll start getting more dejected and start thinking about the consequences. So their denial will become weaker and weaker over time. So even here, they're asking her two questions. Her denial isn't as strong. It's weakening. Does this mean she's guilty? Of course not, but it is something to note. That when someone is guilty, especially if there's big consequences, if their denial gets weaker and weaker and they start, um, you know, sort of winding down and not protesting their innocence that mu as much, it means you're right around the corner from catching them and getting a confession. They're basically, they're breaking down. They're starting to reflect on what's about to happen to them rather than trying to convince you that they're innocent. Uh, did you do anything to Summer? No. Do you know? Okay. Did you do anything to Summer? No. Demonstrative? No. What happened to Summer? No. Do you know? You know what happened to Summer? Almost identical answer. Yeah. Same same qualitative answer. Who took Summer? All right. Do you know who took Summer? Right. Head shakes no still. The voice doesn't even say anything. A silent no comes out, and then she adjusts. We call that fading facts. Okay. Then she gets out a weak no. No. You hear strong no's to the first two questions. Correct. But then when you say, do you know? Right. It's like, no. Yeah. yeah. So what do you make of that? 
So I immediately wanted to go further and push a little harder. And I will say, when, you're, when you do what we do for a living, sometimes people cry and you force them to cry. So this immediately caused the next question. Okay, well, let's take a look at the next tape. Is there any reason anyone near you would want to hurt you or your kids? Not that I'm aware of. What do you think should happen to somebody that did this? To the person that did this, what do you think should happen to them? They should be put away for the rest of their lives. I mean, they should be tormented, I think. Out of the gate, if I ask you what happened to Jordan, he was missing. You or what should happen to that person, don't answer it because I know it would be bad. <laughs> you wouldn't say, it wouldn't be a pause there. You wouldn't say put him away for a long time, he should go away forever. You would have a very extremely graphic answer to that. Yeah, exactly. it wouldn't take me five seconds to think about it. Give me 10 seconds in a room alone right. with him and we'll be through. If someone exactly. stole your dog. This is a common technique. We've seen this in my job, Benet Ramsey series where you ask someone what should happen to the person that did this so in john benet case right they asked the parents what should happen to the person who killed john benet and john gave a very weak punishment i think he said something like they should be punished under the law and patsy ramsey couldn't even give an answer which uh, went on to support my theory about what happened so if you haven't seen that series i suggest checking that out as well as my McCann series. Here, Candace actually gave a better answer than both John and Patsy in that she at least wanted the person punished. And if Don is the one who's responsible for whatever happened to Summer, which I believe he is, she probably has a lot of resentment to him about that, which is why she was able to at least give a punishment, right? To at least say a punishment. Unlike Patsy Ramsey, who couldn't even bring herself to punish the person who was responsible, even hypothetically, right? Because she loves them. Yeah, same answer. That's the answer. Yeah. Same yeah. answer. But the other thing that Candace said that I noticed, I don't know if it's just the way she was speaking, but she said that they should be punished. Like a plural. Which if Don sold Summer to someone would be, she considers both these people reprehensible, Don, who sold her, and the person who bought her, right? the person who took her, or the person who took her without permission, and John for forgiving that person, uh, Don for forgiving that person. So the fact that she said they is interesting, that she might be envisioning two people, and when there's two people, I agree with these guys here that it is transactional. And this is something we said ever since early on in this series, the possibility that she could have been sold. And the way we came to it was based on nothing but the words of Candace and Don themselves. But here, what you get is very different. Here, what you get is... All right, so we're halfway through this. Um, if you want a part three, uh, please let me know in the comments. A like and a comment is a vote for part three. Let's try to get this video to 50,000 views. And once it hits that, I will do a part three. We'll watch the rest of this. There's also an extra portion at the end that we haven't seen yet, which we can also analyze. If you do subscribe to the behavior panel, please uh, let them know in the comments that Deception Detective is reviewing them. And so far, I don't disagree with them with as much as I thought I would. Uh, but I want to see their conclusion, which we'll look at in part three or part four of this, um, because I have been told that they came to a different conclusion about the wells than I did. But please do drop my name in their comments. Let's see if we can get them to react uh, just like we did with Pat Brown. It's fun when different people who are looking at the same case interact with each other. Um, also, uh, if you like this video, you will like the one popping up on your screen now, recommended to you by YouTube, one of my other videos. Or if you want to watch the entire playlist I have on the well so far, all seven videos. The playlist is also on your screen right now. Please click that, give it a view, make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Until next time, stay true.